Thank you very much for the introduction and for you coming today. Uh, this is billed as an educational session, so I'm going to try to be educational. So uh, if you're an expert and know all this stuff, I ask your forbearance. Uh, you can ask me tricky questions at the end, but I'm going to keep it pretty, well, not so basic, but somewhat basic. First of all, I need to say, after two inspiring lectures yesterday, that this is not about normalising single cell data. This is about normalising bulk RNA-seq data. I should have made that clear in my title. Uh, many challenges and some terrific solutions offered yesterday on the issue of normalising single cell RNA-seq data. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell it to you. <laughs> So, uh, first of all, uh, I'm just commenting that I think everybody knows that RNA-seq is the method of choice. And, uh, well, at least in single cell, but even in bulk, unwanted variation is a real issue. And uh, I'm going to mainly illustrate today with tissue from brains, mainly mice brains, mouse brains, but some others. And uh, what I'll show you is that commonly used normalizations don't actually deal with the issue very well, and that other methods, including the one that we are promoting, do better. And uh, I want to emphasize this is bulk RNA-seq, and I'm going to focus on differential expression or differential abundance. Uh, different methods would be needed for classification or clustering or other goals. So we're just looking at the simple task of comparing two or more conditions at the moment. So what's my strategy? First of all, I'm going to define unwanted variation, which I hope will be straightforward. Uh, I want to distinguish, uh, make a somewhat subtle distinction between normalizing and dealing with unwanted variation in a application-specific way. <coughs> uh, in our approach, we make a lot of use of negative controls, some use of positive controls, so I'm going to explain what they are. And I'm going to do lots of examples. Now, what I'm not going to do is give a lot of detail about the methods or a lot of detail about the biology of my examples. I'm just going to focus on how you tell whether your normalization was effective. And uh, I, if you want to ask me about the methods or the details of the examples, please do that in the discussion. I hope to leave a lot of time for discussion. But I will explain uh, the detail of the negative controls in my examples. So that's my plan. OK, so we begin with what's unwanted variation. Uh, of course, everybody likes to use the word batch effects, as though we know what that means. Uh, Yav Gillard yesterday gave a wonderful lecture where he had the most fantastic list of things that come under the name of batch effects that I ever saw. So I'm going to borrow that from him and use it in the future. But basically, everything that you can think about and perhaps quite a lot of things you can't think about would come under the category of unwanted variation. And the term batch is really not adequate. You know, for example, sample quality. Uh, it's hardly reasonable to call sample quality a batch effect. Uh, batch suggests something discrete, something known, whereas sample quality is neither discrete nor known. So we coined this phrase <coughs> unwanted variation. Uh, we also want to combine data across studies, and you might call a study a batch. That's fine, or if you have two platforms or two versions of the same platform, maybe that's a batch, but not everything is a batch. So we've coined this phrase, unwanted, well, we haven't coined it, we use this phrase, unwanted variation, and of course our goal is to remove it. So uh, we're trying to uh, appropriate that simple English expression. <coughs> okay, so bearing in mind that this is an educational talk, I want to just be very clear that we're dealing with arrays of numbers, gene expression values. Uh, in a microarray, they will typically be uh, on a log scale. In uh, RNA-seq, they'll typically be counts, though there may well be some logarithm taking at some point. Uh, I'll perhaps mention more of that later. And in my formulation, rows are samples and columns are genes. And of course, you could have columns are exons or uh, columns are transcripts. There's, there's many ways to deal with this but I'm keeping it simple. Rows, samples, columns, genes. And of course, uh, other people do it the other way around. So I hope this won't confuse you too much if you like to have rows as genes and columns as samples. 
All right. Now, uh, this is the distinction I want to make, which I think when you make it is really obvious, but sometimes people get puzzled. Global adjustments. So-called normalization usually means take your data matrix and replace it by another data matrix <laughs> which has been fixed, cleaned, removed of all the bad stuff, and then do whatever you're going to do. That I'll call a global adjustment. <coughs> now, other approaches might be that you already know what you're going to do and you deal with the issue of unwanted variation inside that analysis or inside that model. And here's a simple example. If I'm doing some sort of linear model where Y is my data and I have X beta, uh, I stick in another term to deal with the unwanted variation. So that in that context, it is not a global adjustment. This is a way of dealing with unwanted variation within that analysis. And if somebody said, I want to do another analysis, please normalize my data, you might think, oh, well, I just removed that red stuff. There it is. <laughs> Subtract it. Well, that's not always right. That's not always what you would do. That's an application-specific normalization. That red stuff will have been estimated in the context of the X beta, and it would be different if you're going to do something different. So it's worth bearing that in mind. <coughs> Most of the time, I'm going to talk about global adjustment of a particular kind. I'll make this clear. Now, there's a very long list of ways that people normalize RNA-seq data. <coughs> I do not want to give the gory details of any of them, including our own. But you should know that, of course, a lot of people think you must normalize by library size. Total count, that's easy. There is a thing called upper quartile. Uh, with microarrays, people like to, used to normalize by the median or the average, <coughs> make that the same across all the arrays. Uh, this doesn't work with RNA-seq. The median is usually zero. So that's why somebody thought of upper quartile, because at least there'll be some non-zero number, and you make the upper quartile of the abundance across all the genes the same. Full quantile, if you know what quantile is from microarrays, you can do it for RNA-seq. And the rest, I'm not going to give details. Uh, and the ones that are in a kind of uh, brown, light brown color, they're all global. The bottom two, Pierre, Panama, and also SVA-seq, they are application specific. They have their quote unquote normalization within the model for doing whatever they're going to do. And they are typically either differential expression or classification or something, but the, they're, they're different from the global ones. So there's not too many application specific ones for RNA-seq. And uh, ours is. I haven't got ours on the list. OK. <clears throat> I need to tell you what negative and positive controls are in this context. Hopefully, it's as uh, reasonable that a negative control is a gene or a synthetic transcript, control transcript, which should not vary across your samples. Uh, that you add it or you believe it. We will talk about examples later. And of course, a positive control is something that should vary. The one thing I need to point out is that people often use the word negative control for a synthetic transcript which should not be measured at all, should not be observed right down there at the baseline background. That's not my use of negative control. So possible negative controls might include the ARCC spikes, which are added, or a housekeeping gene, which is just sitting there and in your experiment at least shouldn't change. So these are real things, not things down at the, at the, at the bottom. <coughs> I'll give examples. Now, uh, PCA plots before and after normalization are very widely used, and I'm going to show you quite a few of them. I uh, just want to point out that PCA has very many flavors, uh, multidimensional scaling, using the singular value decomposition, the variations on the theme. But basically, what you're going to do is take your data matrix and get a low rank representation of it, typically rank two. So you have two columns and two rows, and that's a good approximation to your matrix. Well, it may be good, it may be bad, but it's the one you look at. And uh, these uh, rows, this uh, column, the blue stuff, they're the uh, things that capture the variation across the samples, and uh, across the row there is the gene-specific contribution. So uh, you're going to do this decomposition one way or another. Uh, Multidimensional scaling just weights it in a slightly different way. 
And uh, the loose thing to think about is just that the first PC is the combination of your gene measurements, which is most variable across your samples. And uh, PC2 is the second one, second most variable, orthogonal to the first. And if that all just sounds like some foreign language to you, don't worry, uh, you'll learn to see it in the pictures. So, here are eight panels of PC1 versus PC2. And I'm going to spend uh, a couple of minutes on this figure. So this is to show you there's lots of unwanted variation in, in this particular case. Uh, these are experiments involving mouse brains. And I remember I said I'm not going to give too many details. If we took the top left one there, you'll see that it is wild type 1, 2, 3 versus knockout 1, 2, 3. And uh, the PC1 and the PC2, in a good world, you'd think, well, the difference between the wild type and the knockout is important. So I would like to have wild type knockout on my first principal component. Or if not that, at least the second principal component. I think it's obvious, looking at that top left, that the wild type knockout distinction is not very clear in either the first or the second principal component, right? They're kind of mixed up. <coughs> if you go to the second panel, same issue. OK, <coughs> we've got wild types and knockouts there. Uh, and they're mixed up. I mean, in some sense, knockout one and knockout two, three are on this axis. This one here, you see there's some controls. There's some short hair pin RNA. And there's short hair pin RNA with FC. Uh, FC means fear conditioning. These are uh, pieces of the brain of a mouse after it's been put in a spot and given an electric shock under certain conditions. So that should frighten it a bit, and that should perhaps make irreversible changes in gene expression in the brain of the mouse. So the fear conditioning is there, and the short hairpin is to, to knock down some genes. So there are three groups there, red, blue, and green, and it's pretty obvious that they're not clustered nicely according to the replicates. Uh, here, this is not too bad. The uh, young and the old are at least the first principal component appears to be the age difference. Uh, if we go down here, it's a little hard to read all that, but you've got controls, you've got NOR, which means novel object recognition. These are experiments I really like. You put a mouse in a particular cage and it has an object in front of it. And you ask the mouse to stare at that object, well, you don't ask, you allow it to stare at that object for a little while, and then you take it away and rip out its brain and find evidence that it saw something. Uh, that the gene expression changes can be recapitulated when you put that mouse back in front of the object. But, so novel object recognition, and there's some controls and uh, some knockouts. So, but you can see they're all mixed up. Here, we've, again, we've got controls, and AD, of course, means Alzheimer's disease. So we've got a mouse model of Alzheimer's there. Uh, here, it's very hard to work out what's going on there but there's some fear conditioning, there's some single end data, there's some paired end data. So it's a kind of a mishmash of RNA-seqs of very different kinds. So those five were all taken out of GEO, and this was actually the experiment we tried to publish, uh, and you can see there HC means home cage, and OLM means object location memory. So that's another one of these object experiments. Okay, so. Uh, I hope you can see from those eight panels that the clusters are not as nice as we would like. You would like the replicates of the same thing to be grouped together and to be nicely distinct from other things. So that's our goal. A good normalization should show you that. <coughs> so this is the first four, the top four panels at the top, and below that, is the result of using a method called RUVS. And uh, let's hope you can see here that this mix-up of knockout and wild type has been separated, so the wild type knockout is on the first axis. Uh, ditto for this guy, wild type and knockout. This one here, we've managed to group the green, the red, and the blue a little bit better. This one here, well, it was already quite well separated, age, and it still is. Here's the other uh, four panels at the top, as they were before, and below is the normalized approach. So you can see that this mess of red, 
blue, purple and green has been somewhat split up into clusters of red, blue, purple and green. <coughs> this lot here, these are all the controls uh, and uh, the, the, anyway, we've got a better grouping here. Controls group, different age controls are all the same and we've got these two. This is a pretty challenging one. It's been separated a little and these guys here have been opened up. So uh, I'm offering those slides to you to suggest A, there is a lot of unwanted variation in uh, this uh, stuff to do with mouse brains and B, uh, the conventional normalizations, which I neglected to tell you, uh, like upper quartile here, upper quartile, uh, fragments per kilobase per million, these are standard normalizations. Uh, DE seq 2 is they have normalizations built in. Uh, that's a combination of two normalizations there. They don't really fix it, but the RUVS doesn't do a bad job. So that's meant to be a sort of a partial advertisement for RUVS, but also just to show there is a problem to be solved. Now, uh, <coughs> that analysis needed some negative controls, and in all of those studies, we just used everything as negative controls. And you might say, hey, that can't possibly be true. There's some differences. Well, the method is somewhat robust to the definition of negative control. And if you like what you see, uh, don't worry if the negative controls are not perfect. But we also made vital use of the replication. <clears throat> now, other, other options for negative controls, housekeeping genes spiked in transcripts, negative controls from previous studies are obviously the perfect ones. They, and, of course, you can find them empirically. All right. And more, the more, the better. OK, I'm going to show you another type of plot now, which is useful for examining the impact of your normalization. Uh, we call them RLE plots. If you haven't met them before, they're a bit like box plots of the abundance of the transcripts or of the genes, but they've been centered, gene-wise centering. <coughs> And here's eight of them for a different data set. These are some olfactory neurons in the uh, mouse, in the zebrafish brain. And uh, well, the raw data is the one on the far left, top left here. And uh, the idea of this centering and these boxes, ideally they should be all nicely aligned along zero and with a pretty much equal width. And when they're not lined along zero, that's bad. And uh, when the width is unequal, that's telling you something too. So these normalizations are not doing much. Uh, this is the one that uh, our normalization, it's got them reasonably well lined up, but the actual width of the box is different because some of them, uh, one of them at least, uh, the uh, treatment 11 is an outlier and needs to be downweighted. Uh, I'm not going to give you evidence that this is a better normalization. Visually, that's the sort of thing you want rather than at the top. I want to touch on p-values because the histograms of p-values are a powerful tool for seeing whether your normalization is effective. If you've got a lot of unwanted variation, normalizations can be uh, seen to be ineffective by the very bad shape of the p-value distribution. Uh, if you don't know now, one of the important little facts from statistics is that if you have a null hypothesis and you do a p-value and the null hypothesis is true, that p-value can be anything from zero to one, equally likely. You only get small p-values when your null hypothesis is false. Uh, if it's true, it could be anything. Could be small, could be big, anywhere in the middle. So with these type of experiments, we expect the majority of our p-values to be anything because we expect the majority of our hypotheses to be null. Most of the time in these experiments with a knockout, or a little bit of misregulation or something, uh, very relatively few genes change. Let's say at the maximum a few hundred, but certainly not thousands. So let's look at some p-value distributions. This is fear, con uh, fear conditioning versus control cage controls. So this is uh, you know frightening the mouse and then looking at its uh, cortex versus mice from the same cage which weren't given the shock. Uh, Left-hand side is upper quartile, all the p-values. And that does not look terribly uniform. It doesn't have a spike near zero, which should correspond to the uh, small p-values, whereas after you use this thing called RUVS, 
It's relatively flat. It's not perfectly flat. And we've got a nice spike of some differentially expressed genes. You see, uh, this one, well, there's a spike of less than 200 rather small ones, whereas here we're going to get over four, 1,400 small ones. So, reasonable number of differentially expressed genes. Of course, you might ask, how do I know they're real? And we'll get to that in a short time. So here's another picture of a bad p-value distribution on the left and a good one on the right. This is the retrieval. So these mice have been given the electric shock and then have been able to sit in their cage for a day and then have been put back in the same conditions in which they got the electric shock. And wow, their brain uh, notices that they're about to get electric shock. Uh, that's the retrieval experiment. And uh, the uh, upper quartile normalization is pretty bad here and the AUVS is okay. Uh, and this is a yet another way to look at p-value distributions, uh, a little bit like what people call QQ plots, just a cumulative distribution of the uh, p-values. And uh, the, the, the top grey line is totally unadjusted, the red line is when it's been given the upper quartile normalization, and the purple line is with the AUVS normalization. These are comparisons of controls to controls in a set of data called SEQC, which is uh, a set of, uh, a whole collection of uh, uh, RNA-seq experiments that were done by uh, a, a group in the NIH. Uh, so along the 45-degree the line is what it should be. So uh, that's another way to see the bad stuff. Volcano plots are useful because there we can, ex we can see the impact of our normalization on positive controls. Ideally, a good normalization should remove the false positives and enhance the true positives. That's what you're looking at in this context. So uh, if we look at this volcano plot, uh, this is fear conditioning to cage controls. Uh, Left-hand side, upper quartile. The red dots correspond to genes which are positive controls from a very similar experiment done with microarrays uh, a few years earlier by the investigator, and uh, the green dots are negative controls. So these are prior experiment positive and negative controls, and you can see that the AUVS normalization gives you bigger fold changes, smaller p-values, and generally a lot more interesting stuff. The blue stuff there is above the false discovery rate cutoff, and there's many more in the uh, right-hand panel than there is in the left-hand panel and your positive controls are sort of dragged up much higher. So positive controls looking better, negative controls looking okay, you are inclined to trust the blue guys, which are the novel ones that you've learned in this study. <coughs> Here's another one just to see the same idea. This is retrieval versus cage controls. Okay, uh, I mentioned that this person did the microarray analysis uh, of, the sa of the same conditions. So here's an interesting plot to compare the results from the RNA-seq experiment with the results from the microarray experiment with two different RNA-seq normalizations. So you can see there it's headed concordance between microarray and RNA-seq. Uh, vertical axis there is the concordance, 30%, 40%, 50%. Uh, out of the top 100, 200, 300, etc. So if we put the line there at 100, you can see that with the upper quartile normalization, we've got about 20% agreement in the top 100 microarrays and RNA-seq, whereas with the uh, AUVS, we've got 40%. So it gives you a better agreement with the previous studies, which sort of thing we all like. Combining data across different studies is uh, something that I mentioned uh, we want to do. Their different studies are kind of like batches, so you need some sort of normalization to deal with this. Uh, and I'm just going to illustrate a very common situation in my uh, institute. People are always doing experiments. You know, you're going to knock down a gene and use just wild type black six as the uh, controls. Then somebody else knocks down another gene, uses wild type black six for the controls. Then somebody else drops down a third gene, uses wild type black six. If you take those separate experiments and look at them, they're all different, even though they have the same controls. So the question is combining those with have the same control and get extra power. 
So here's a simple example where, well, I said what it is here. We're looking at the fear conditioning, which is one uh, study with wild type black six controls, and the object location memory, which was a second study. And you see, if you do the PCA plot down there, all you see is the two studies. And if you look at these RLE plots, they're horrible. So <coughs> this is not a very good uh, encouraging for combining the two. If you use the RUVS, then the home cage controls and the cage controls, they all, the controls all group, and you're now nicely in a position to combine the data and compare the two non-control uh, conditions uh, within the combined analysis. 25 so minutes. That's, am I? That, no, that was 25, yeah. How many minutes? 25. Yeah, yeah five, so I've got yeah, five, five minutes. more is fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am, I've left a lot of time for questions. If you don't ask me questions, I guarantee I'll give you a million slides with mathematics all over them uh, to use up my time. So please ask questions. How does it work? Well, I hope you got the idea of negative controls as things which should not change. They carry information about unwanted variation. And that's what, one of the reasons we look at them. But replicates also carry information about unwanted variation because differences of replicates, let's say on a log scale, or ratios of replicates, if you're keeping the original scale, they give information about unwanted variation. So this thing called AUVS is just combining those two sources of information and removing it, removing the unwanted variation. And a little bit of math would be there if, uh, if anybody really needs it. What's the take home message here? Replicates and negative controls are important. The more, the better. Positive controls are good too, to see how well you're doing. In practice, this is just what people call design, that you think about your study before you do it. And you build in replicates, and you build in negative controls, and you build in positive controls. There are some variations, because not everybody has a data set with lots of replicates. So we have in our package RUV Seek uh, a couple of variants which don't require replicates. Needless to say, they don't do as well as the ones that do require replicates, but they do better than the other stuff that I've been talking about. Uh, and we have a thing called AUVG4, which is, we hope, an improvement over AUVG2. Final comments. People often ask me, after you remove all this unwanted variation, can we tell what it was? Can we identify it? Because, of course, in a way, that would be good because, uh, then we could perhaps redesign our lab work to get rid of it. You don't need to know what the unwanted variation is in this story to remove it, but nevertheless, people want to have it. So the answer is that sometimes you can figure it out. I mean, of course, if it's a batch effect and you see the batches, that's really easy. But if, it's, if they're just sort of all over the place, you don't quite know why. Was it your dissection of the mouse, mouse brains? Was it your reagents? Was it your operator? So you need a bit of extra information to be able to track down what was going on. And I should add that on our agenda, particularly after the wonderful lectures yesterday by Yav Gillard uh, and Oliver Stagel, uh, doing this sort of thing for single cell RNA-seq is definitely more challenging, but Oliver showed a, a rather good uh, approach to dealing with that. I have a whole pile of acknowledgements. I'll just mention them very quickly that Lucia is the one who uh, has got us all into all this brain stuff, but we've been dealing with other things. Davide, Sandrine and John Nye, that's the zebrafish olfactory receptor system. Johan and Laurent are my partners in crime in this, this program of RUV. We want to remove unwanted variation from anything in sight. What I've said works for, obviously, for microarrays and methylation arrays and bisulfide sequence and mass spec and metabolomics. So it's a sort of a general style. And Jing Xu is responsible for helping uh, develop the uh, AUV G4. And the final slide is some references. A couple to us, a couple to Jeff Leakes, SVA Seek, and Peer. They are what we regard as the competition, but in uh, the spirit of uh, peace and harmony, I'll uh, be very happy to put them up on my slide. So thank you very much for your attention. And do ask a lot of questions, because I think I have one or two minutes left. Yeah, about 10 minutes left, more or less. Yeah, right. great. Thank you so much. Yeah, so please come ahead and do ask questions. Uh, 
I'm sure there must be uh, quite some, uh, because I think uh, this is really, you know, a real challenge that we all have in front of us to deal with uh, all this unwanted variation in the high throughput data that we have. So, yeah, please go ahead. Hi, so this is Robert Carcelo from Barcelona. <clears throat> Thanks for the lecture, Terry. It's, it's great. And I would like to ask you whether you could clarify for us a little bit more uh, in what way you use REV for normalization and in what way for adjusting for unwanted variation and in what, way, in what circumstance you do both at the same time. Because for me, it looks unclear when are you normalizing, when are you adjusting for unwanted variation, when are you no normalizing with another method and then adjusting. So, to answer that question, I need to refer to the model, right? Uh, if you don't have a model and you do stuff, let's call that normalization. Uh, if you have a model and you estimate that red term and then go ahead and estimate the beta as well, that's within the model. Now, uh, you might say, well, can I estimate the W and the alpha outside the model and remove it? Just sort of subtract it. And the AUVS permits you to do that. So the only uh, sort of guidance, as it were, that the AUVS has is that you have to declare replicates. So you have to know that certain samples have essentially the same signal. Uh, we can estimate the W part of the AUVS, uh, the W part of that thing, from the negative controls. We can estimate the alpha part of it from the differences in the replicates. We put them together and subtract it. So it's a very slightly guided generic normalization. Uh, even if we have no idea what X beta is, you can still do it. Is that helpful? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Sipko from the UMCG in Gronia. Um, you say um, the method relies on negative controls. Um, those are genes that you know are not changing expression. How do you know which genes those are, or are those only spike ins? Uh, this is like the thousands most common question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I get it all the time. Yeah. Well, I have two ways to address this. One is if we show by causative controls that it helped, then it doesn't matter what you used for negative controls previously, right? It helped. So that should make you relaxed. Because I don't want an argument, is there a perfect negative control? Housekeeping genes are neg not negative controls. Spike ins haven't experienced the same conditions as the samples. Uh, empirically determined negative controls are going to be biased. Blah, blah, blah. Right? You can go on forever. So uh, basically, we're going to look for plausible, effective negative controls and look at our positive controls if we have some. Of course, if we have none, that's a slightly different issue. But if you have some and you appear to be doing better, the p-value distributions look better, the RLE plots look better, the PCA plots look better, uh, your positive controls look better in the volcano plots, who cares whether the negative controls were any good or not? They worked. Is that a good answer? Yeah, yeah thanks. I have um, one more question then. So the uh, probable negative controls you get from previous studies, is that like a large range of, of genes then? Or well, that... uh, in the study we did with Lucia, she had... She was basically replicating an RNA study with, uh, with, uh, with uh, a microarray study with RNA seq. So she had plenty of genes which showed no evidence of changing on the microarrays, and plenty of genes which change a lot on the microarrays. And they were used. The latter group were used as positive controls, and the earlier group were used as negative controls. And it all looked pretty good. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hi. This is Lara Nonay from Barcelona. Thank you for this very nice talk. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep on this <laughs> negative controls uh, question. And the question would be, would you recommend to um, like subsetting your information in genes, like keeping the, uh, so s selecting housekeeping genes, the spikings, and just try the different subsettings and see how the normalization works? Well. Uh, just one preliminary comment. In our papers on this topic, we have reams of stuff about negative controls because right. the referees always go bananas about it, <laughs> just like people in the audience of my talks. So 
I won't be able to tell you the whole story for guidance of negative controls for the rest of your career. But let's just say you can get started with something sensible. Under certain contexts, like these examples, using everything is fine because the methods are robust to the strict negative control assumption. But uh, often we say start with housekeeping, looks okay, maybe enlarge it because more is definitely better. Uh, it gives you stabler estimates of the unwanted variation. Uh, so, you know, we have, we have some guidelines in the publications. Because this reminds me to the normalization of PCR. So the quantitative PCR is taking all, always the uh, housekeeping genes, yeah. and there is also controversy about that. So oh, no, which, no, which... no controversy in my mind. Okay. Uh, <laughs> depends how many genes you've got. Right. But you can beat the hell out of just using housekeeping genes. So typically people have one or two, right? You have GAP-DH, you have yeah, B-actin. But Michael they don't look the same, yeah. yeah. This is very bad. Yeah. Normal, when I say more is better, I really mean that. Okay. Normalizing with one thing is a disaster. You're adding noise to all your data. Yeah. You know, you think you're correcting for bias, and you may, but you'll be adding noise. So have at least five or ten housekeeping genes if you're going to use housekeeping genes. But consider the possibility of using everything. Everything. Because that can be done too. This is what you've shown in one of your pictures, of your slides. I, uh, so um, so you, yeah. would you recommend to just try, start by trying and uh, using everything? Yeah. Well, okay. if you have positive controls, you right. can experiment, and this is not illegal. You can find a method which makes your positive controls look best. That's perfectly legitimate, I think. If you've got competing approaches and you've got positive controls to tell you what's working, then do that. Uh, look, I haven't even bothered to touch quantitative real-time PCR. That's such a huge industry. You are never <laughs> going to dislodge practice there. But don't use just one or two housekeeping genes. No, I know. This is really bad. Here we use about 800 housekeeping genes. That's okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks to you. <laughs> oh, but Terry, uh, imagine you were in Spain and you had some budget uh, constraint. Would you, uh, you know, if, if we had to pick between, you know, putting in uh, 50 negative controls or doing more replicates, what should I choose? More replicates, uh, <coughs> more negative controls? Okay, uh, the question, uh, I guess you all heard it, but how do we trade off if you have limited resources, how to spend money on negative controls, how to spend money on replicates? They're challenging questions. The short answer is you have to send me an email and I'll try to give you some guidance. Ideally, you would like some sort of simulation uh, or something to, if you really want to optimise your experimental design. But remember, part of it also is going to depend, do you have positive controls? Uh, and uh, what do you know about your system? Are you looking for tiny changes? Are you looking for massive changes? Yeah. So, you know, yes. context matters here. Yeah, so the taking home message would be, all, like always, uh, um, design first and think what you're going to do and, you know... And, that's the first you know, take-home message. That's the first Design take carefully. <laughs> Second take-home message, send me an email. Okay. Any more questions? Done? Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Might be a very simple question, but um, this unwanted variation should be random over the genome, or do you think that it might be related yeah. with the some genes? Thank you. That's a very good question. I should have emphasized this. Those global normalizations are never gene specific. They just scale or they reshape the distribution. These custom normalizations are gene specific. And of course, that's what you want. Some genes are, are affected by uh, lab conditions or time or place or reagents, and others are not. So uh, that's an important point that I failed to emphasize in talking about the difference between global and application specific. They are all of the second group are gene specific. And that is definitely what you're going to want because that's what happens. Not everybody is affected by so called batch effects, some genes much more than others. Okay, thank you for the question. Apologize for forgetting it. I think it's time to sit down. Yeah, okay. If there's any more rushing last minute question, this is last one and then we move on oh, to the next. Okay. No, well, you know, maybe I, we have a few seconds. If you both of yeah. you are quick, okay, that's yeah, okay. Um, Aaron McDade, no problem. Based in Lausanne, Switzerland. Yeah, so you said we could choose the best uh, method based on which does best on the positive controls. Um, like, so could we simply say we want a method does, that makes the positive controls look significant, the negative controls should remain insignificant, and then 
uh, that selects the... Yeah, well, prim look. Yeah, as long as we don't select the... Uh, the method that makes the um, unknown genes look significant. That well, would be cheating. Well, look, yeah, I mean, obviously that was a dumb remark. No. Uh, <laughs> it was right in spirit. After all, if you look at your PCA plots with the raw data and they look horrible, and you look at them after you normalise and they look better, which are you going to use? That's a form of data snooping, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to give you a, a licence to do whatever you like, to try 27,000 normalisations and choose the one which is a tiny bit better than all the rest, because that's bound to be, you know, like a chance fluctuation. But if you have a number of broad categories, this set of negative controls versus that set, uh, and one is clearly better than the other, you're going to go with it, I think. But, but clearly there are potential changes there. So I would have to have a caveat if I wrote this down. Yeah. All right? Yep. And I think you're aware of that. Yeah, thank you. Okay.